we'll go ahead and kick off and I'll let Michelle introduce herself. My name is Michelle. I'm a graduate student in physics astronomy at the University of Miami. And I'm Rachel, and it's funny because I uh, felt like the thing that I got most nervous about for today was the introduction. And I feel like that's been an increasing theme in my life because I don't know exactly who I am for that day because I have all these intersecting personas. Um, so I thought today I'm just going to tell you all the things that I do. So um, I've been a long time faculty in molecular biology and now in chemistry and I teach biochemistry and microbiology and a great passion of mine is curriculum development and particularly um, inclusive pedagogy and um, in STEM fields, that's something that is particularly important and sometimes missing. So um, a capstone course in microbiology is kind of one of my greatest um, pride and that is that we use microbiology to solve community problems. So we work with places like Wyoming Medication Donation Program and look at how um, the wastewater is impacted by improper drug disposal. Um, so I love designing curriculum. I always have been a really, really passionate teacher. So about three years ago, I was given this opportunity to um, begin as the interim director for a program called LAMP, the Learning Actively Mentoring Program. And it's legislatively funded, so we're really, really lucky. I've thought about throughout this conference how privileged we are to have money to spend on many of the things that a lot of the educational developers here are struggling to find money to fund. Um, so the LAMP is a multi-faceted um, thing, um, just a little bit like, like I am. Um, and, and I should also mention, I in my volunteer hours, I direct the Queer Studies minor and um, additionally coach the cross-country ski team with Christy. So a lot of different um, intersecting identities, and I think all of those have impacted the intersecting identities of the program um, that I've, I've now um, just recently taken on the position permanently as, as director for this program. So I wanted to tell you about um, the different areas of LAMP, and then we're going to zone in and um, really look uh, carefully at the learning assistance component of this program. But the fellows program is the oldest and largest component of it. So this is where we have through application um, faculty at the University of Wyoming as well as graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and faculty from around the state of Wyoming, from all of the community colleges, they all can apply for this program. So we select about 25 each year. Um, to date, we've trained 71 fellows. And we began with an immersive, intensive uh, summer institute where we spend a week in retreat style. So we travel with our fellows to far off locations and, and really take them away from the stresses of the day so that they can immerse in teaching and learning training. So that's a, a really amazing way to kick off what is a year-long and sustained program. So throughout the rest of the year, we work with them individually and in workshops to allow them to develop curriculum, um, to, to come forward with an instructional strategy that we help them work through. But we also help them with alignment of that strategy as far as what assignments align with their outcomes and then what assessments align with their assignment so that they come away with that full circle of course development um, and particularly focusing in on active learning, so the ways in which you can get your learners engaged in their own learning. And we're going to do that today. We're going to do some active stuff. Um, the, the other component that you see pictures from, and actually uh, several different pictures here, from the Science Roadshow is this one up here in the right-hand corner. We travel around the state of Wyoming. That picture was taken in Rock Springs. And we go to K through 12 and bring our researchers, our undergraduate researchers, with us. So another part of the larger program is to support undergraduate research. It's called the Wyoming Research Scholars Program. And so some of those young people travel with us to these high schools and get the students thinking about science. So this picture is showing them um, measuring the plasticity of clay, and we're looking at how microbial populations in clay affects plasticity. So they get to learn about that. So the Science Roadshow, we've, um, we've touched about 1,400 students, and the program's less than 
it's just over a year old, so we're very young with that. Um, so the, the last program and the one that we're going to talk most about today is the Learning Assistant Program because um, once you begin active learning, and this is a picture here of the students all working on the glass writing boards in a very non-traditional classroom. So this is actually taught, this class was taught in um, a huge foyer with glass writing boards all around it. And so the learning space becomes very informal. Um, it's not like this stadium seating that we become so used to. Students are really the center of their learning and it's um, very much about them and not you. So you have to switch from that sage on the stage to the guide on the side. And um, it's a, a tough transition, but it's made even tougher in those really, really large courses. So this is a class of 140 that you see at the top banner. And so it, when you have 140 students or 200 students in a class, and you turn the class over to them, not only does that require spaces that enable um, small group work, but it also requires extra help. Because even if you are the most, like I love running around my class, like I am very active and I will run from group to group to group to group. But on the other hand, you can't give rich attention to 26 different teams. Um, you can maybe get to all 26 in a 50 minute class, but you're probably not able to ask them those rich, deep, thought-provoking questions about what they're doing. Um, and so with, with that, um, having a learning assistant becomes paramount. And maybe in some of the large classes, having a lot of learning assistants. Um, so this class had up to 10 learning assistants who would um, nurture two teams and really ask deep questions of those teams, really push their thoughts, and in some cases even give them feedback, like a rubric assessment as to how, um, how they were doing in, in that. So those are our three programs. But looking at that learning assistance program in specific, and Michelle's going to tell a little more about the fact that this program is embedded in a much wider national network, and it's a program that you can look to assisting you know, your universities and institution. And if you're trying to catalyze that recalcitrant move to active learning, this is one program that can really help support your faculty as they move in that direction. Uh, the learning assistant model was developed at CU Boulder. Uh, they were trying to train their undergraduates, especially pre-service teachers, to get some experience, but also to help bring active learning into large-scale classrooms. So the leftmost image is what our traditional model is, where there's one professor and many, 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 many students. And um, you know, as Rachel said, you really can't talk to many people in that sort of atmosphere. You can't get to know people really well. So. What C. Boulder tried to implement was, or did implement, was this learning assistant model where a team of learning assistants who were undergraduates um, who had taken the course before were proficient in the content, not experts though, but at least proficient. Um, the instructor would have a team of learning assistants and each learning assistant would be responsible for a subset of students. So they would facilitate discussion in multiple groups, so instead of the professor having to run around, as Rachel said, to 20 subgroups, each learning assistant would manage a couple groups, so the groups of uh, students would still get individual attention from some sort of mentor or leader in the, in the program, or in the classroom, uh, not necessarily the professor, but when a professor came around, it was much more managed. Uh, they had a lot less questions or Actually, probably what happened is they had a lot more deep questions when the professor came around. So there's a lot less um, hands-on management for the professor and more rich content. Um, so they were able to break uh, it into small teaching in a large classroom by utilizing learning assistants. And one reason they used learning assistants over TAs was, first of all, there was the aspect of that they were peers. They were only a couple years older, so students often felt more comfortable talking to learning assistants than the TAs because the TAs had this authority and they gave them grades and the TAs might wrap them out to the professor. So it was a lot more comfortable for students to talk to a peer learning assistant than a TA. And also, learning assistants are a lot cheaper to fund than a graduate TA, which was another consideration that they had. And uh, the 
See, so Older Learning Assistant Alliance talks about three pillars of the learning assistant experience, which is practice in the classroom, they get to practice facilitating discussion. Uh, pedagogy, everyone, for the first time that they are a learning assistant, is enrolled in a one unit pedagogy course. And they learn about best practices in STEM and active learning education. And then in content, they meet with their professors once a week to help the professors plan out the next session and the lecture and give ideas about activities that they could do and how to break up the lecture into more active learning style. So the three together uh, compose the learning assistant model. And uh, T. Holder at least has found absolutely great results about um, learning outcomes and student enjoyment and uh, prep for pre-service teachers as well. And so we were very excited to launch this program in support of our instructors. And we were able to go through a really rigorous process of hiring the right graduate student to oversee all of the learning assistants, and that was Michelle. So um, we put out a call for graduate students to apply, and she, um, she was the, the most qualified. And so her job began then in the fall of 2017, when we kicked off the program with five learning assistants who were funded. We had some additional non-funded learning assistants at that time, and in large part because they didn't feel that they could enroll in the pedagogy course at the same time. Um, and so we, we were able to, to train five in the fall, and then you'll notice our numbers were growing nine in the spring. Um, and then we, we had one in the summer, of course that was a smaller number, but then 13 in the fall of 2018. So we are increasing the number of learning assistants that we can support. Now mind you, this is across the sciences, so these learning assistants may support general microbiology or they may support um, a, an invertebrate zoology course or they might support physics and astronomy courses. So they're across the disciplines. Um, so five of these were from the College of Education and through a specific collaboration that we built with the College of Education. So when we sat down to talk to them about their underserved populations in that college, they said that the, the post-baccalaureate students who go back, they decide they want to be K through 12 teachers, and they didn't decide that until after they finished their bachelor's, so they go back for an intensive one-year training. And in that intensive year, they often don't get any kinds of practicum prior to going into their student teaching. And so our collaborator in College of Ed said, you know, Rachel, if you could help with one population, it would be this post back population because we can give them a hands-on experience in an active learning classroom before they start their student teaching. So we've been really fortunate to have that collaboration. There's not a large number of post -backs any given semester at UW. Um, I think our current numbers are at 12. So, so far we've managed to train five of those students in the learning assistant program and they've taken the pedagogy course and then in an active learning classroom. So what's really neat about that is that we're able to then vertically follow these students and ask them to reflect back as to how LAMP has helped them in their um, practicum. And so I've asked them to annotate their lesson plans and to send me feedback as to the times they thought of LAMP and how it helped them. This is a quote from one of our students um, when she was in her practicum. She said, the training and exposure to active learning that I received as a learning assistant, uh, assistant influenced my teaching style greatly in a number of different ways. And then this is just one way she listed. We had an activity concerning percent composition that involved using chalk to write on the sidewalk outside, and another activity on the same topic that used bubble gum and the percent sugar that could be calculated as lost from the calories put into chewing the gum. So she was able to take a lot of that active learning and apply it in her student teaching, which was really wonderful. And so we have all these anecdotal responses that we can get from our learning assistants, but our goal for this study was just to take more time to look more deeply at um, doing a, a kind of a social project that um, Michelle was doing as a piece of her 
um, inquiry, and she'll tell you more about the details. We've heard a lot about SOTL and the way in which it's context-based, so while the Learning Assistant Program has been studied, it's never been studied at UW, so we can study it in our classroom at UW. And it is sort of classroom-based, um, you know, that Michelle teaches the pedagogy, the white pedagogy course. So with, with that being said, it is sort of based within her classroom, but it also goes a little bit broader in that these LAs are doing their hands-on across the university. And so it even is more, it's a hybrid between sort of a SOTO and a true educational research study, and it's a qualitative study. So we're gonna tell you a bit about that, and actually we're gonna have you help. We're, we like to practice what we preach, so we're gonna do some very active um, hands-on stuff here momentarily. So as part of my fellowship, I was required to take a couple educational research classes, and I found myself in a qualitative research class, which as an astrophysicist was a little bit of a stretch for me. Uh, but our, one of our assignments, well, our big project through the semester was to do a qualitative study. And so I'm like, okay, well, I have this captive audience of learning assistants in my class, so I, and we were interested in seeing um, what their feedback for the program was, if they thought things were going well, what they needed, what kind of support uh, was going to be best for them. So I said, okay, two birds with one stone. I'm going to make the project we wanted to do, I wanted to do with Rachel, um, my assignment for my course. So the purpose was to investigate the perceptions of their, the LAs, uh, what their experience was, how they think they had an effect on the student learning, if at all. Most of them think they did, so that was good. And uh, I had four research questions because I didn't really know how to narrow it down to one because it was my first qualitative study. So what does the learning, the LA experience look like in the first year of the program? Uh, how do they perceive their impacts on the learning experience? What insights can they give us about the program? And how can the LA program help future K-12 educators prepare for their service? So what I did, uh, I just did a general qualitative inquiry. I didn't have any special um, narrative or case study ethnography. I just did a basic qualitative study with interviews. Um, and a friend of mine had, uh, had already done a focus group with learning assistance from the previous semester, so we said, okay, let's go ahead and stitch this together because our goals and our findings greatly overlap, and there's no point in doing two weaker studies when we can do one stronger study. So I did a bunch of interviews as she took notes on a focus group, and the way we analyzed our data was through basic coding, which was basically sifting through all of our transcripts and looking for themes that came out. Yes. And we have too small of a group to do this part of our activity, but I'm gonna tell you about it so that you can use it in the future. Um, so we know that uh, Putting students into diverse teams is a great idea because diverse teams always come to more creative solutions to problems. So one simple way that you can go about it is this post-it exercise. So I had intended to put folks in the room into groups. Um, we really only have enough for one group. But these are some questions that can get at certain things that we've talked about. Remember we talked um, in Terry Doyle's um, keynote address about being a lark or an owl and so you can you can say you know if you are a lark grab this bright yellow post-it if you're an owl grab this you know, we probably should do blue you know post-it um, and and so on forth um, are you civically engaged or less likely to engage um, wh whether you are uh, an early submitter or more of a procrastinator um, and then I gave an example, if one of your manuscripts is rejected for publication, are you more likely to move on and send it to a lower tier journal, just say, like, forget that journal anyway, or are you like, no, I'm gonna rewrite it and I'm gonna submit it again. Um, the idea of this last one is to get at growth versus fixed mindset, um, though I, I have some discussion about that. I love over coffee if anyone wants to think more deeply about growth and fixed mindset and how it interplays with marginalization. But, um, but in any case, these are just some ways that, a simple way, so the students put the colors on themselves and then they, I asked them to find the team that has the most colors so that they have every color of the rainbow in their team and they get, um, it's a very uh, one way to get diverse teams if you don't have a lot of time in your class, so it works out really well. 
So with that being said, we're going to launch right into the activity that teams are going to think about. And I think this is um, really, really rich. So um, I'll let Michelle tell you what we've got here. So what I have as for the materials are uh, my interview transcripts and all 21 pages of them that you three get to go through, or four, Rachel, if you want to do it, since yes. you want to look at you. So you get to sift through 21 pages of my transcripts and try to find themes or major uh, important points that the students that I interviewed, um, well, basically what they said, and what I was trying to find, I did not go, I went in with a set of questions to guide me. Um, some of these, what's your overall LA experience? How has your mastery of material changed? Those are my basic just starting questions, but this was only a semi-structured interview, so I was able to evolve, and if they said something interesting, I would follow up with them. It wasn't a very strict interview where, you know, I can only ask my 10 questions and then be done. So these were my ideas that were guiding, um, so that's program, not program. Um, these are my, my ideas and questions that were guiding the interviews. So a lot of the responses that you read will probably be surrounding this, but not necessarily. And um, some of my interviewees were very verbose and very passionate about it, and some were very nervous and gave me very small answers because they didn't want to say something stupid or they didn't want to offend me because I'm technically sort of in charge of their grade, even though it's Rachel. but. Since they were in the course I was teaching them, um, I don't know if that maybe had an, an impact. Hopefully it didn't. I wanted it to be very candid. Um, so I've got a lot of good stuff. So I'm going to give you the sheets of paper, and then you're just going to sift through them and sort them into piles or write on them, whatever you want to do. And hopefully you will um, identify some major themes and important points. And then since there's a group of one, you will disseminate <laughs> to each other or to me. <laughs> straight lecturing but you went through about what half my data in 10 minutes and it took me hours and hours to sort through all my data on my own and I did not get as many uh, themes as what you guys have pulled out. Oh good. Cool, perfect. That's, that's, good. that's good timing. So this is just uh, not only a great way as Rachel demonstrated to break into groups but also um, shows the power of a diverse group and different people's ways of thinking and this series it was so much faster and more efficient than what I spent hours doing. But what I ended up finding, uh, can you go to the next one? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I found five emergent things and some of them thankfully were the same ones that you guys identified so I'm not completely off base and as with any qualitative research study these things are not completely independent. There's a lot of overlap so you can think about it as a Venn diagram with five different circles, various uh, uh, areas of overlap. But my first thing that I found was increased confidence. They 
not only came into their roles as an LA and knowing what their responsibility in the classroom was, but they really did understand or realize, I should say, how much they have learned and how many connections they can make to higher level classes. So they not only notice an increase in their confidence as an LA in their class, but they notice an increase in their confidence in other classes as well because their experience reaffirmed their knowledge and they just felt like, I really do know a lot. I'm not alone in being confused, but I know how to get through it. So increased confidence was a big one that people had noticed. And then the hierarchy is kind of what Rachel was saying was this lack of agency. Uh, they didn't really know where they fit in in the classroom hierarchy. They're clearly not the professor. They're not even as high as the TAs, and they're a little bit above the students. So they're like, what am I? A lot of them didn't have grading responsibilities, but some did. And several of them were TAs at the same time as well for other courses. So they're like, what is my responsibility? And this kind of goes with what um, the I'm not an expert quotes that a lot of people were giving is that students would look to them as if they were experts. And they had, again, to get the confidence to say, no, I don't know this, but I will find out for you, or let's find it out together. So they were, there was a struggle there, especially at the beginning, but again, they grew into their roles. And a lot of them felt a lot better at it um, at the end and had the confidence to say, no, this is what we're doing. Um, I know active learning is hard for you, but you're just going to have to deal with it. So they, they, they grew into their, their shoes a little bit. And then number three was learning to learn. They learned how their students learned, and they learned how they learned as well. A lot of them noted that they wanted to teach the way that they learned, which I think is natural for most people, but having such diverse groups that they had to take care of or had, had to facilitate, they were learning how their students preferred to or how they best learn and so they would start tailoring their questions or their approaches to these different styles and that of course took a little bit of time because they have groups of like eight people and they have two groups sometimes so it took a little bit of time for them to adjust but they were able to eventually evolve their ways of questioning and instructing and made things go a lot easier. And again, that kind of goes back with increased confidence. They were able to, um, once they were more confident in their roles in LA and their mastery of the material, they were able to better help their students. But a lot of them did experience frustration because they, again, did not know their place in the hierarchy of the class. And they didn't know how to deal with these difficult students at times, and they felt personally responsible if their students were failing. So I was sad to see so many people talking about frustration, but at the same time, it's okay, well, they care, and they want to do better, and so they found new ways to try to help those students, and again, you can never reach everyone, but they really did go the extra mile, so these allies did far more than what was asked of them in most cases, because they really, really were invested in their student success. And the last one I noticed was the appreciation of teaching. Not all of these students were going into pre-service teaching, but a lot of them, as you said, uh, as you may have saw, like um, one person flat out said, I really appreciate any professor who's doing this. Um, I see how difficult it is. I'm going to incorporate this into my field, even though they're not going to stand up in front of a classroom. A couple people are going into healthcare. One's going into counseling, I believe. So they said any sort of communication and letting people know what's going on. I've learned invaluable skills on how to communicate knowledge from an expert to a novice. Mm -hmm. Not so many words, but um, so a lot of them really did find an appreciation for teaching, even if they are not going to pursue it themselves. But a couple things stood out to me. Um, concern about experience. Several of them expressed concern about their own experience, but one LA in particular, who was a senior, expressed concern about freshmen and sophomores serving as learning assistants because they didn't have the experience. And she felt that she, being a senior, was respected more and knew more, which may have been true. Um, so she expressed concern about having people like freshmen who took the class in the fall then LA for in the spring. She's like, mm, I'm not sure if that's the best. And I'm like, okay, that's, it can be a concern, but uh, the freshmen that I interviewed who were the allies, they were just fan freaking fantastic. So, <laughs> you know, three years difference at this age is like really not that different. It was almost advantageous for the freshman because he's like, I was with where you were last semester, I know. So that was, you know, something that we could keep an eye on, but I don't think it was too big of a concern, but she was very concerned about it. So I'm like, okay, but I will 
keep an eye out. And the second one was clarification about expectations, and this is multifaceted and it's a very good suggestion. Um, clarify for the students that the LAs are not experts, they're not TAs, they're not there to baby them, they're, they're there to facilitate discussion. Clarify for the professors that the learning assistants aren't TAs, they're not experts, they're not supposed to grade, they're not supposed to have millions of office hours. Um, they might anyway, but they're not supposed to. And LA's are supposed to help with the discussion. They're not supposed to just sit there and pass out papers, which unfortunately happened to one learning assistant. And also we had one learning assistant who was a pre-service who seemed to think that the program was supposed to be for pre-service teachers only. And uh, instead of putting them in college classrooms, we should really be pairing them with local high schools and middle schools. And I'm just like, okay, but that's not our job. Like, <laughs> that's, you can talk to the College of Education if that's what you want, but that's not what we're doing. We preferentially hire pre-service teachers just to give them a little bit of experience and some funding so they can complete their coursework. So she was a little confused about the fact that we preferentially hire them versus this is, we're here to just serve your purpose. Mm -hmm. So clarifying for everyone, since it is a brand new program, what exactly the role of an LA is is essential and we're working on doing that better. So we're thinking of a nice letter. Yes. <laughs> yes. And we we have some resources for you if you would like to check out what's available through the CU Boulder Learning Assistant Alliance. This is a support network for adopting learning assistants. Um, they also have some online assessment tools such as their lasso that is now much more seamless for people to access it. It was at one point very difficult. However, now you can actually sign up and they'll, um, they'll if you put your students into their system, they'll send the students a pre and post survey, which is- Does the, the learning assistants or the The, the um, students. And so that's the, right, that's the next layer, is that we assess the learning assistant experience, but we do as specifically assess the students. Experience. So this is something that can help with that, uh, and pedagogical resources as well. And of course, please feel free to use us as a resource because we um, are working through this process. And if we're just one step ahead um, and learning from our experiences, maybe we can be a great resource in things that we tried that either did or didn't go really well. Um, and also maybe just knowing what we um, worked through with regards to the suggestions and maybe you could kick off by having an informational letter or regular emails or involving professors in the pedagogy class as well so that they're really aware of what is and isn't the role of the learning assistant and then of course the learning assistants also having awareness of that too. Thank you for coming <laughs> and we have we have stickers and we have bookmarks and we have active learning spectra. <laughs> so take a couple. <laughs>